You arrived here on the University of Auckland campus half a century ago. What was it like back then? Much smaller. Uh, actually, the old Gothic building on Princess Street was the main building. That's where uh, the, uh, the library was, it's where the student canteen was, and the lecture theatres were the upper and lower lecture theatre. And what was it like being on staff here and at a time, like you said, when there were very few women in the teaching profession? Well, you didn't feel discriminated against as a, as a woman on the staff. And uh, Bob Chapman, you know, appointed me uh, over, you know, I guess other <laughs> other guys and, and candidates. But you did notice that you were in quite a small number. Mm. And uh, it, it's good to see now how much that has changed, that women are very prominent in, in academic life. But it really needed that wave of post-war baby boomers to come through to, to break the ground on that. And you were quite involved in politics the moment you stepped onto campus um, and participated in the Princess Street branch of the Labour Party, which is quite famous in term historical terms at least. Can you talk about that? Was that a place that was a female-friendly environment and were women's issues you know, part of their um, repertoire or was it more about the foreign policy stuff that was going on at the time? In the late 60s, the foreign policy issues were the dominant issues for students on the campus. And so there was the issue of uh, whether, I think it was Mount John and the South Arvon could be used as part of a series of American listening bases. Uh, there was, of course, the Vietnam War, there was the anti-apartheid movement, and there was the movement against nuclear testing. So these were all things to mobilise around, and I got involved in those issues from the time I came to the campus as a, a foot soldier or someone who would turn up at a protest uh, somewhere. And then in 1970, I, I was on the the committee for Halt All Racist Tours with uh, Trevor Richards and, mm. and others. Women were very involved in these movements. You, you never felt that there was any, any issue about that because we were in significant numbers on the campus and we you know, took our part in everything that was, was going on. When I went to Parliament at the end of 1981, uh, the numbers had doubled from four to eight. It was still a pathetic number. Mm. I mean, it was clearly under 10% of the Parliament mm. at a 92-member Parliament at the time. And so you were a, a t just a tiny minority and, and not taken particularly seriously, to be frank. Uh, very few women had ever been ministers. Three, mm. actually. Uh, Mabel Howard, who was the first in 1947. Dame Hilda Ross uh, for the National Party. She was a Hamilton member. And uh, then Fetu Turakatni Sullivan was the Minister of Tourism in the, in the third Labour, Labour government. So it was very rare to have women ministers. And when you went into Parliament as a young woman MP, really your top aspiration was maybe one day I'd be able to become a, a minister. And that was a, a big hill to, to climb. So it wasn't a welcoming environment at all. The Labour Party caucus was very, very tough, actually often very unpleasant. Mm. Uh, if you were on the more progressive end of it, you came in for quite a, a lot of um, uh, hard time, actually. Uh, but, you know, I just sort of knuckled down and fought my way through it. And I did think, uh, after I'd been at it, you know, close to six years, that if I couldn't crack through uh, to become a minister in that third term, uh, then there might not be a lot of point in staying around if there was just always going to be a blockage. But then, in 1987, I did get elected uh, to the cabinet of the fourth Labour government, and I guess the rest is history. If you had, you know, a crystal ball, what would you say still needs to get fixed and if it's possible in terms of thinking about women's rights and women's place in politics? I think we're now on the third stage of feminism. I say the first stage goes back to the battle for the suffrage, a battle fought, you know, and successful in the in the eighteen nineties. And then you had the second wave of feminism which really came with the post-war baby boomers who weren't going to be constrained the way they saw. So often their mothers had had their career aspirations uh, constrained. 
Uh, so, you know, we were a generation that wanted choice and wanted to do things. And I sometimes wondered whether we made it look too easy for following generations, mm -hmm. because really, after us, the feminism kind of went into a bit of a, a dive mm -hmm. because people thought the battle had been won. Well, now it's the third phase because we're dealing with the unfinished business. Now, one bit of unfinished business, obviously, is the gender pay gap, but it, it's smaller than it was at 10%. It, it could be close, particularly if men's life cycle patterns become closer to those of women and they take more responsibility for children, older parents, relatives with disabilities, mm -hmm. all the needs in the broader family that, that women still disproportionately attend to. Uh, globally, three quarters of the world's unpaid work is done by women. Speaks volumes, mm. probably the same here. Uh, but then there's this really pernicious issue of the domestic, family, sexual and gender-based violence in New Zealand. Now, it's said that we are the worst in the OECD. How on earth can this be? Mm. That our lovely country can provide the worst environment for violence in the home. I, I don't get it. Just finally, if you had mm. one piece of advice to give young women enrolling in a politics mm. or any other degree mm. now, and, mm. and they had aspirations for political office, what, what piece of advice would you give them? I'd say go for it. Women must believe that they can do those jobs, and they can do them very, very well. Of course young women should think of politics, and the atmosphere in Parliament is a very different atmosphere from what when I went in, because there are so many women. Mm. At, at close to 40%, we can see that with goodwill from political parties, in two to three elections, you could, you could have parity. Mm. It's that close. Mm.